thank you for the invitation and I'm happy to share my results with this new electrolytic approach providing an implant surface which allows the re integration uh, into the tissues, into the bone and also in integration in the soft tissues. Now, when we are talking about uh, uh, treatment of periplantitis, I guess you will agree periplantitis is difficult to, to treat and as Alberto uh, shared, uh, there are a lot of factors uh, which uh, uh, introduce or uh, uh, perimplantitis. And the question is, um, how can we remove those biofilms and achieve an implant surface which will integrate again into the tissues? But reducing the problem to bacteria misses out a, a really relevant part of the entity perimplantitis. So the aim of this lecture is to understand the complex nature of pemplantitis in a better way, and based on this, to develop a clear treatment strategy. First of all, of course, of course, I would like to discuss aims. What are the aims of therapy? Then I would like to discuss current treatment concepts and introducing the new electrolytic approach. Yeah, what are our aims when we are treating pemplantitis? Elimination of pus, reducing of bleeding on probing, reduction of uh, probing depth, is that enough? What will happen to a rough surface uh, exposed to, to the oral cavity over time? And for how long does a patient expect us to solve the problem forever for a certain time period? These are questions we have to address. And I'd like to share this case. We had a severe bleeding, uh, pocketing, and we did a cleaning with classical approach, and we were able to achieve a reduction of probing depth. And after one year, we had no pus and really no bleeding. But again, I guess you know how this case ended. Finally, we had to remove this implants. So the question is, what will happen to an implant surface which is not covered by bone and which is exposed to the oral cavity? To answer these questions, we need to think. We discussed now different surfaces uh, and uh, to, to, the, to investigate that, we uh, uh, had titanium plates, exposed it to bacteria and breeded a biofilm, put those samples every day under a SEM and found out how fast this uh, biofilm grew on different surfaces. You can see here a sandblasted and edge surface, a sandblasted and edge surface which was polished by implantoplasty and a machined surface. And uh, I don't, uh, uh, to, to make a long story short, these are the pictures after three days. We see a biofilm uh, on the rough and also on the smooth surface. So we didn't find that difference in rough and smooth implant surfaces. So uh, this was a kind of disappointing result, but this knowledge is not new. First was the first who published that in 2007. Bacterial colonization starts immediately after an implant is placed and the surface is exposed to the oral cavity. So I guess we need to do more than cleaning an implant. I guess uh, a relevant aim would be to achieve a surface which allows reintegration into, diff uh, into tissues, a surface which allows, uh, if possible, a complete re integration. And re integration doesn't mean bone grow, like we see in, with several techniques. Normally, when uh, Perimplantitis is treated in articles. We are seeing an X-ray before, a clinical picture, and an X-ray after. But histology of those cases show very often new bone which is not integrated to the implant. And if you look closely, you will see on the right upper edge that bacteria start to recolonize colonize those surfaces. And we all know how the story will end. Finally, we will remove this implant. If we are discussing current treatment cons concepts, they are ablative. So we transfer the knowledge of periodontology to, uh, to, to implant treatment and try to remove biofilm with curettes, 
with powder spray devices, with different kind of brushes. And we all know that it is very difficult to clean such surfaces because the micro texture of those implants doesn't allow access with all those ablative therapies. Imagine how a bacteria feels when you uh, try to remove it with a, with a curette, for example. I guess they feel very comfortable uh, in these little dots there. And uh, also, if you look to this histology, the defect morphology very often does not allow access to the implant, especially to the uh, undercuts of the threads. So we have a problem, a macro mechanical and also a micro mechanical problem if we try to clean those implant surfaces. Yeah, and if we are desperate enough, then we can uh, uh, polish those implant surfaces. I didn't do so many cases because I never liked this titanium exposure when we try to apply these techniques. Also, there were difficulties on the border. Should we, uh, should we grind bone away to be sure to polish everything away? And just to show you how this case ended, we had to remove this implant after one year. And when we put this implant to the SEM, we found uh, a mature biofilm on this smooth surface. So obviously uh, we need to do more. Um, is this thinking, these ideas, are they, uh, uh, can we find it in literature? I just grabbed out this article. There are several others and we need to understand that we don't have any reliable evidence that a single treatment modality would be superior to another one. And this article suggested a very high percentage of relapse of periimplantitis. And I guess this is that what everybody of us experienced. So the idea was, couldn't be there a way where we don't use an ablative way, but having something which penetrates the biofilm and acts directly on the implant surface under the biofilm. And this is possible by an electrolytic approach. So we load the implant with a low current, five, around five volts, and we uh, uh, spray the implant with an electrolyte. And you see this electrolyte passes this uh, uh, electrode. Uh, this anode is positively loaded. The implant is negatively loaded. And then we have a current between the anode and the negatively loaded uh, uh, implant. And because the implant is sprayed with this electrolyte, uh, uh, water is split into hydrogen cations and hydrogen anions. And uh, as you know, this hydrogen cations penetrate the biofilm within milliseconds, go to the implant, so directly underneath the biofilm, and uh, they grab an electron and then we see hydrogen uh, coming up as bubbles and those bubbles lift off uh, the biofilm. So this device does not augment, this device does not uh, um, cure perimplantitis, but it removes the biofilm. And as we will see, it provides a surface which is able to re as before. Uh, uh, misplaced implants cannot be treated because yes, we can clean it, but on the long run, uh, if we cannot augment them, they will reinfect and those implants should be removed. To give you a clinical impression, this is the video of a treatment with the electrolytic, uh, uh, electrolytic approach. The hydrogen bubbles, uh, which you can see here, lift off the bacterial biofilm uh, clean the implant surface and as we will see, removes even hydrocarbons and makes the implant uh, hydrophilic again. To give you our, this is the test implant contaminated with a mature biofilm and cleaned in a, in a glass uh, in vitro trial. We apply the voltage and you see the hydrogen bubbles coming up and uh, what we are seeing uh, the biofilm is uh, removed completely uh, via SEM. We cannot detect any bacteria anymore. Uh, it works on any implant surface, on any implant alloy made of metal, of course. You cannot treat uh, uh, ceramic implants because 
uh, they they uh, don't uh, uh, we cannot load it. This is uh, a, a sample of a collective. We've investigated 400 of them. Uh, implants removed because of perimplantitis and cleaned them in a in vitro try. And I'd like to share this picture because the white spots you see on the SEM picture is bone. And this is to understand that the process is only effective where the electrolyte is in direct contact to the implant surface. Where the implant is covered by bone, uh, the electrolyte is not in contact to the implant and is of course not effect. So uh, the messages where the implant is covered by bone, um, we cannot destroy this bone because the uh, process is not effective. Uh, after cleaning, you see a clean, smooth surface and the bone is still in place where it was. Uh, does it work on any surface? As I said, yes, this is a very rough surface to give you just an imagination. This is a plasma flame surface. And if you blow up to a high magnification, we don't see any bacteria. To summarize this uh, in vitro tests, we can uh, state that this electrolytic technique removes any visible biofilm of, from implant, any implant surface made of metal proven by SEM. It works for any surface or alloy and areas which are covered by bone are not affected. Then we did of course a bunch of in vitro tests, just picking out one. In this test, we compared the electrolytic approach uh, with uh, powder spray technique, which is one of the most applied techniques. Uh, we sticked very close to the, uh, to the manual of the, of the producing company. Uh, after this, we put the implant in a, in a nutrition solution and breeded it for 24 hours. And you see the, the difference in colors. On the right side, you see the uh, powder spray device. On the left side, you see a very clear solution. And now we spread it, the solution on agar blades, breeded it for another 24 hours and tried to find out how many um, um, colony forming units could we count. And with the electro electrolytic approach, no single no single colony could be detected. And it was also not possible on the uh, powder spray device because so many bacterias grew that not a single uh, colony could be detected. So we thinned the solution. And when we thinned it to one to one million, then we were able to count singly. Um, in this in vitro test, we uh, found out that we were not able to breed any bacteria uh, on the uh, the test devices which were cleaned by the electrolytic approach, but we were able to, to breed a, a lot of bacteria uh, on the uh, powder spray device. Uh, staining is another method to, to prove uh, the amount of bacteria. This is a fluorescence test and every green spot uh, stands for a living bacteria on this uh, uh, mature biofilm you see on the left side. Then we cleaned those samples and in the center picture, you see a, a, a sample which was cleaned uh, by a powder spray and on the right side by the electrolytic, uh, electrolytic approach. So what can we state? We can state that no bacteria can be detected by SEM or stained or breeded in vitro when we cleaned it with the electrolytic approach. Then we went in a in vitro, uh, in a preclinical study uh, uh, ligature-induced perimplantitis in dogs, three groups. So test implants were treated by the electrolytic uh, device. Uh, control implants were treated classically and eight implants were not treated. And to make a long story short, there was no difference between the control group and the negative uh, control group, meaning that this kind of uh, study with ligature-induced perimplantitis is not representing real perimplantitis because just removing uh, uh, the suture had the same results like treated it, treating it with a classic approach. But uh, let's discuss the results. We treated the control side, we augmented it, and then uh, we, uh, after healing, we took some histology and where we, where we, we were able to find a lot of new bone, but most of the bone was not attached to the implant that we discussed that issue before. 
on the long run, we all know what will happen with this rough surface exposed to the oral cavity. This is the test site cleaned by the electrolytic device. And the results we were able to find, this was a, a representative and uh, typical picture for that. So in some cases, to be honest, this was the, the best one. <laughs> so we were able in this case to achieve a bone growth um, uh, over the implant uh, higher than the platform. So what can we state? Uh, we can state that uh, in preclinical animal studies, it was possible to achieve a complete re integration. But now let's go to the uh, story, which is more interesting to you, to clinics. Uh, this is the device. Uh, on the right side, you see the spray head. This uh, little uh, uh, metal device has to be contacted to the implant. Uh, the sponge holds the water in place, the, the, um, the electrolyte in place, but we will see that in clinical videos in a while. So this is the uh, device in action. Then we did a clinic, the first clinical studies, the CE mark studies. So we, again, we had a test group and a control group. The control group was cleaning with uh, the electrolytic approach because we knew that uh, with the uh, powder spray because we knew that will not work. After that, we cleaned it uh, those group uh, electrolytically. We augmented the situation, left it for six months of healing, and then we did a second stage surgery. To share some cases, this is. Uh, an easy case, we removed the restorative parts, uh, did some uh, cleaning processes, the hygienist worked to reduce inflammation. I guess this is a point which uh, increases uh, the, the results, uh, reduce infection, reduce bleeding before you do the surgery. But we know that from periodontology, periodontology anyway, so this is not very new. Uh, after two weeks, you, uh, the tissue closes over the implant. We see this fistula, if we probe, we still had pus, we still had bleeding. And then we open those sites, classical approach. I'm a periodontist and I'm used to do a crestal incision. I guess if you start from the buccal side, there will be no, uh, no real difference, but uh, I prefer the crestal approach. Then we did some, some smear tests to, to do PCR testing before and after cleaning. This is uh, the electrolytic cleaning. You can see the hydrogen bubbles, the clean surface. You see a little blood clot, can remove it or not. It uh, doesn't play a role. Then we augmented the site with a mixture of a xenograft and autogenous bone in this case, suturing, and you see the nice healing uh, anybody of you who tried to clean implants, augment them and close the flap knows how rarely this happens. We see it in the most of the cases. And uh, in this case, clinically, we had bone higher than the, than the crest of the, uh, the, than the top of the implant. This was an implant from the, from the test, from, from the control group. So we opened it and the, uh, we did a, sm a smear test to do a PCR test. And then we cleaned it with a powder spray device and did another PCR test. This were the bacteria which we found after cleaning. Then we cleaned this implant electrolytically and did another PCR test. This was the result after this PCR test. Now we augmented the site. This is after four months because the patient moved to America and uh, the bone is not very really mature as you can see, but uh, uh, radiologically and also clinically, it seemed that we had bone which yeah, is somehow attached to the implant. Of course, we cannot claim re degradation clinically because we don't have a histology. To share some cases, this is a more severe defect. We have a, 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 a defect horizontally and vertically, and we need to maintain space. I'm using this umbrella screws to to tent up the space and to fill it with particulated bone substitute. In this case, it was an allograft. This is after six months. You see a certain settling of the allograft and we found rock solid bone to the top of the implant, which I never saw before. Uh, more severe case. This implant was uh, placed five years before. 
um, I could probe the Schneiderian membrane on the buckle aspect. It was only fixed on the lingual aspect a bit. Then we cleaned the implant uh, with the electrolytic approach. You see the sponge, which blew up by, by getting wet, uh, holds the liquid in space, even in, a, in an upper jaw. And uh, after cleaning it, we augmented it again with a mixture of autogenous bone and axinograft. You see uh, the result. We had to remove bone to have access to the implant again. So we had a real stable situation still after nine months, still after 18 months. And this is a very typical result of this technique. We have to understand, as Alberto addressed before, that we have different defects. And I would like to introduce a classification pointing to, to, to the regenerative potential, so the RP classification. If we have really contained defects, we call it RP1. If walls are missing, RP2. If they are extra bony, RP3. And as you can see, when we compare the numbers, then we are able to achieve different amounts of new bone, of bone gain, meaning that not every extra bony defect should be treated. If we cannot augment it, we could fail on the long run and those implants might be removed uh, um, um, on the long term. This shows you the amount of complete uh, uh, bone fill. Um, you see in RP1 cases, all the cases uh, achieved a complete bone, bone fill in RP3. Um, so uh, to give you a, a few short examples before we stop, um, this is an RP1 case. Um, again, um, very wide defect, a crater-like, a cup-like defect. We see the augmenta augmentation before, after the, the X-ray, suturing. You see the heel situation. Sometimes a bone particle comes through, but this is not a real issue. If you open it after six months, you see bone up to the implant. So this is after nine months from the buckle aspect. This is after 25 months. So a very typical situation we were able to achieve with this technique. RP2 cases are more difficult to augment because walls are missing as Alberto demonstrated very, very nicely. And this is uh, an impression uh, which uh, demonstrates why we want to clean also the inner side of the implant. The pumping effect was discussed before. And uh, this device was made to clean the outer side of the implant. And as you can see also the inner side of the implant, uh, uh, we remove the biofilm also from the inner side of the implant. And then we are able to have a uh, an implant surface which allows a reintegration into tissues. But of course, in those cases, sometimes you have exposure. And I'd like to share also a case with this complication. This is after two months. This is after six months, still no pus, no bleeding, no nothing. And this is the X-ray after. So even if it exposes in some times, this is after 24 months, uh, we very often have stable results. And uh, this is the X-ray after the cleaning. Sometimes we have tartar on the implant. This is an issue because the device doesn't remove it and we have to do it uh, classically with curettes or whatever. Uh, and uh, I will share a histology uh, after a few minutes what happens when we leave tartar on this device. Tenting technique, augmentation, heel situation. This is the bone we were able to get so this is very repeatable. RP3 cases are really difficult because uh, um, uh, we, we are not able to augment them. So you have to decide, shall we remove or maintain those implants? We try to close the flap over these implants, but we are, we are knowing that uh, very often, like in this case, we have an exposure. But as you can see, uh, still not a complete bone fill, but a, a bone fill which is nice enough and the clinical uh, results demonstrate a uh, long-term result. This is after three months. This is after 18 months, of course, recession, but a stable situation uh, in this case. This brings us to the question, do we really, really need to close the flap when we have exposure in some cases? 
This is after 24 months. This is the bone fill after open healing we had. And again, this is an open question. We do not know if we need to close the flap. Uh, the first, let me say 120 cases, I tried to do that. Uh, uh, in the last few months, I tried to, uh, to enhance the limits and to let those cases heal uh, open. And to be honest, look at this case, uh, in, in some cases or in a lot of cases, the results were very promising. And uh, I'm not sure this needs to be investigated. More data need to be, collect to, to be collected. But I guess not in any case we need to go for a, for a closed healing. This result is a, is a typical result which we were able to, to gain with this technique. This was after six months. Uh, I'm coming to the end. Uh, this is an implant really misplaced. The patient asked me to try it. I asked her to, to let me to remove the implant. And this was after augmentation. We had an exposure, we had a reinfection, and finally we had to remove the implant. But compare the bony situation. Clinically, we had a bone fill, even in this case, where the pus was flooding out of the sulcus of this implant. This was the implant removed. And you can also see clinically that we had a, a bone loss almost to the apical third. And now there was a bone on the implant. And this uh, is one of, uh, this is the histology of this case. We see new bone and we see this new bone is uh, reintegrated to the implant. So this is a first proof that re integration is also possible in humans, not in animals. So clinically, we can also achieve re integration. Another case, we had to remove this implant also because of infection after treatment. So eight months after treatment, we removed the implant. And as you can see, a new bone re integrated to the implant and also to the calculus, we were not able to remove in this case. So this is, was very, very promising to me. Yeah, my time is over. Um, to, to conclude, these are the conclusions which we uh, uh, harvested over time. Uh, also, clinically, it seems to be possible to achieve a real RC integration. We have now uh, three histologies. Um, final, totally, I treated 180 implants. Nine I had to remove. To be honest, before, I, I would have removed all those 180 implants. Now I had to remove nine. Uh, the rest of them is uh, under in histology, histologic preparation. We will come with the article soon uh, and to prove that re integration is uh, possible clinically, even in those cases where we failed. The amount of regained bone uh, obviously correlates with the defect morphology. So this is the critical issue, as Alberto discussed before. Um, uh, and a complete regain of bone seems to be possible with this method. So with that, thank you for your kind audience.